It's really fascinating talking with Judy Lynn, which I've been doing, and I know many of you remember Judy because she was here in Las Vegas for, long, for so long and was such a big hit and uh, was on the top charts with your songs, Judy. And uh, I know that uh, starting in 1959, we were talking about, you were at the Golden Nugget. Yes. Is that where it all started for you? Well, actually, it started at uh, Harold's Club in Reno. We lived in Nashville, my husband and I, and we starved to death. We couldn't get in the click, you know. So he came out, drove a station wagon out to uh, Reno, and talked Harold Smith into booking a country and western show. At Harold's? At Harold's Club, in the seventh floor. This is when Harold's was, was the place, you know, all over the world. And so he booked us in there, and we, you know, really went over. So then, on the strength of that, John came down to Las Vegas and talked Bill Green into booking our show, who owned the Golden Nugget, one of the owners. Isn't so. that fascinating? Well, how long were, was Reno? What year was Reno when you did that? 59. It was October of 59. And in the same year you yeah, came to Las Vegas? Yeah, same year, Vegas, right. And uh -huh. you went right to the Golden Nugget? Yes. And we worked at the Golden Nugget for 10 years. And uh, then on the strength of our success at the Golden Nugget, we went to Caesars Palace, the first country and western show to play the Strip. Then we worked the Flamingo for seven years. Wow. So, and then we worked Harris for 14 years between Reno and Lake Tahoe. Hmm. So. That is a fascinating story. Well, your name is like, for me anyway, I'm very country oriented you know with the, the guy yeah i like your gals. boots you got a western belt <laughs> well, western my shirt my nakona texas boots yeah. on but anyway. i gotta tell your audience we have time sure how i met this guy <laughs> which one's on this one over here okay i was in first cafeteria i just got here from oklahoma right yeah. okay i'm in first cafeteria with my husband and my aunt josie and I'm, we're eating away, you know, and I look over yonder and I see this character, this long, tall guy, you know, <laughs> eat, listen, listen to this, eating a hard-boiled egg with pepper sauce. <laughs> now, I've heard of a lot of things, but never a hard-boiled egg with pepper sauce on it. Well, what's so great about the story is uh, Judy comes walking by me, and I'm not really paying any attention, you know, and she says, you've got to be from, where, where did you say? I said, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, out of that. <laughs> And, and that, I was wrong. I said, you've got to be a musician, uh, and you were <laughs> First thing I said, no, I'm from Kansas. And I thought, I wonder what I've done to make her think that. Or, oh, I, I you know. And, it was uh, so funny. And then she says, you're a musician. No, and I said, no, I'm in, I'm in television. Then I, and, and I, I introduced myself, and then I said, what's your name? And she said, Judy Lynn. And I went, oh, my goodness. And it's one of those great stories because, um, you know, I followed your career because I've been here since... Uh, early mid 60s and yes. I was very aware of your background and, and your hit records and as a matter of fact we were talking about your records you had three that were number five yes and then I had two that hit the easy listening charts the three tunes were what Judy one was called Padre and the other one was married to a memory and then the three country tunes uh, one was my father's voice the calm before the storm and footsteps of a fool mm. you know what's so great about those great tunes is that they will you know, they will live on and on. Yes. They will be played on and on. And that's one of the great things about being a movie actor or a singer. It's like your, your art has been recorded in history. Yes. And, and it's, it's nice, you know, yes. that uh, I see some of the, uh, the movie stars. And I had Ben Johnson on the show, who's one of my great oh, favorites. Oh, I love that guy, actors. yes. Uh -huh. You know, he's just the exact same guy yes. sitting right where you are as he is on, on the big screen. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he was, it was so beautiful hearing him talk because I... I could see him on the big screen as his voice. I love voice. his voice. Yeah, he's got he's a incredible. neat Western-sounding voice, isn't he? You've had so much success, Judy. I'm curious uh, when, I, I hate to say it ended, because I know you're still singing. You're, you're, you're uh, doing a lot of religious gospel music. Yes. So when did it end? It ended November 15, 1980. John Esquaga in Reno, or Sparks, at the Nugget, he had a farewell party for us. And we did our final show We had uh, in the celebrity room. We had over a 1,000 people, and the governor of Nevada was there, Robert List and his family, and uh, Red Stegall and uh, Gaylord and Holiday. A lot of the stars we used to work with, with her, were there. Oh, and uh, we did a three-and-a-half-hour show, and then we said goodbye to everybody. And then I sold everything, all my costumes, my, uh, our bus. Everything's gone. I sold it all. I have maybe two costumes left. Judy, that's very touching. Yes. I, I can't, I, I can understand why it happens because uh, this is, Judy was just telling me this and I'm thinking, unbelievable. When you were at the Golden Nugget, you said you were playing there three nights a week. Yes. Now this isn't, this no, is. No, we worked, we worked six nights a week. That's right. A month at a time. But three nights, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we would do six shows a night. 45 minutes on, 15 off. 
We'd do a 45 minute show, the curtain would close, we'd run upstairs, change our costume, come right down, do the second show, the same thing the third, six shows a night. Then on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we'd do four show, shows a night. That is, that's staggering. It is staggering. We worked hard, we really did. Then we rehearsed twice a week. We started out making 1750 a week. We had 10 musicians. And we, $1,715 a, uh, that $50 was, a week. That was for the whole? For the whole, everything. And ten musicians. Help, ten? Yes. Counting yourself? Yes. We that's, started that's at the very, very bottom. See, nobody thought country music would go in Nevada. Of all places. Of all places. Nothing but country. I you know. know. But this is when we were really looked down on. I know what, Jesse, your cameraman here, I know what it's like to feel like I'm black. <laughs> you know, our, our show would come on, people would see our boots and hats, and they'd get and walk out. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. Well, but, I don't know what the musicians do today, but I mean... Uh, I could mention a few names. I will mention a few names. <laughs> I'm not going to get in any trouble. I have heard stories about Waylon Jennings, who appeared at the Riviera. Uh, I don't know how many others. Not only in country, but in but in the uh, in the pop side too. Yes, you know, uh -huh. who have either some of them have walked out on their contracts or have not exactly showed up on time, or when they did, they were blitzed out in pretty bad shape. You know, and I thought to myself, boy, somebody who would do six shows a night who had that kind of energy and, and vitality and, and some of the other people I shouldn't pick on Waylon Jennings it was just one story I heard mm. I've heard some stories about a lot of other people too some of them may just be stories too but anyway they don't do it the same way anymore do you think it's a whole new ball game Dennis that's why um, I just had to get out uh, we always had a clean show I was always on time we were always rehearsed you know well dressed the, I wouldn't even let the boys sit in their costumes you know, I wanted it so clean, and and then uh, we, the the lyrics to country music, you know, got to be where now that's just pornography and music, mm -hmm. and you can't sing "Cool Water," you know, fourteen <laughs> times a night. <laughs> cool water. You know, it's just, you can't do it. Uh, so anyway, I could, I just the pressures, yeah. the egos. That's, everybody's trying to make themselves known. They're trying to be bigger, yeah. and it's unreal, but. Uh, someone asked Rockefeller how much was enough money, and he said just a little more. Rockefeller, said, Rockefeller that. said that. You're never contented. You always want to get well, bigger and bigger until where the success syndrome will just eat you up alive to where you can't sleep because you're actually jealous of everybody else because you're afraid they're going to be bigger than you. And if you make it on top, top Dennis, then you're afraid that someone, someone else is going to replace you. Yeah. I'm curious about, uh, I have a couple of questions. The first one is, I'm curious about the turnover in that 10 years. Was it, were you able to keep your uh, rhythm guitar player, your lead guitar player? Were these, were you, because I know what it is to rehearse you know a new like. member of a group. It is a pain. It is a pain. How that, many? That's the biggest single problem, other than the pressure and the road and the heartache. Uh, trying to keep a good band together. What was your turnover like? Was it, were you? Well, we had really very little turnover in comparison. In fact, Jimmy Dean said that we were the only act that he ever booked, you know, on his television show that had the same band when they came back. We were the only one. So, uh, we, but we still had turnover. Yeah. You could not please a musician. They just, I mean, it's unreal. The grass is always greener on the other side. I don't think that's really changed either. Uh -uh. No, I it's think the, that'll always be the always, same. It's the ego. That was ego. my next question. <laughs> I, I love this one because I'm very touchy on this one. The ego problem is is one of those problems that I think are in in a lot of professions, especially in radio, television, yes. and in and in your business, entertainment. I am telling you, I you know, people never know what's going on behind the scenes because it's you you, you see your favorite star and uh, whether it's a Merle Haggard or whoever it is, and you're and you're there and you're just having a ball. You know, you're having so much fun. And I, and I can be the greatest audience in the world because I have all my favorites. But behind the scenes, that's why I can, I can relate so well to uh, a lot of people are going to say, why would she do that? She had all this fame and fortune. But uh, the ego thing is a problem. It is unreal. It is unreal, Dennis. We all have got it. We've all got the ego problem. We all want to make ourselves known. Is there and to a it, it will eat you up alive. In other words, we spend all of our lifetime trying to win a losing battle. Mm -hmm. And that's why, number one, there's two reasons why I gave up show business. Number one, I couldn't take the pressure anymore, Dennis. Yeah. And number two is uh, I realized, you know, at 36, 
that's when I was when I had a tremendous experience. Uh, you got you got, you're going to have to come down. Mm -hmm. You cannot stay on top all the time, and somebody else is going to replace you. So then, where do you go? So you have to face reality, and as, in other words, the I, me, mine, and my itis. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that one before. <laughs> I like that. It will destroy you. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you keep fighting and fighting and fighting until you're old and gray and fat? No. You face reality and realize there's a better way. Well, I just think, Judy, that it's, uh, you know, I know that I'm included. You have many fans, and uh, your name will never be forgotten. And uh, it, it's, when I saw you, you know, my, my first question, I think, was uh, when, we, when we ran into each other at first, like, what have you been doing, Judy? Yeah. What's happening? You know, and I, as a matter of fact, I didn't realize that you had this thing that happened in 1980 as far as giving up the business. But uh, it didn't surprise me. It was like, you know, I said, well, okay, really? <laughs> because uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's I've, what little part I played in at the entertainment uh, business and, and with uh, radio and television. I can, I can relate to it in my own way. And the times that I had my own band uh, and, and did the rock thing and, and the country and all that, uh, that was my touchiest, touchiest of all, was, was not being able to keep a group and I having to re it. rehearse no all the songs you all over again. You cannot a musician. That There's used no to way. drive me crazy. I know. Well, I guess you just pay them a lot of money. And, Even uh, then they'll quit you. <laughs> <laughs> because we did pay good money. I we furnished everything, paid for all the costumes, the cleaning, all the transportation, the hotel bills. We paid for everything except their food, and they still were not happy. I, I don't want to say that. Uh, I don't want to say you're out of touch because I know you. I know you love music, and you must yes. still listen to all your favorite records, and you probably have your own favorite uh, singers, and, and did all the way through. You know, we always mm -hmm. follow our tunes that way, or learn the music by some of our favorites. But uh, are are you in strictly a religious? Uh, everything you do now is uh, musically is is in, in a religious vein. Well, see, what happened, Dennis, when I was struggling, you know, so hard to get on the top and then realize you're fighting a losing battle, I just, I got alone one day and I just, you know, said, I said, you know, Jesus, if you're real, where are you? Mm -hmm. And there's a song that I used to sing called, He Was There All the Time, Waiting Patiently in Line. Mm -hmm. Well, he saved me. We have a hole in our heart that's empty and we try to fill it up with fame, fortune, some people with money, some people with sports, some people with sex, some people with drugs, alcohol. Mm -hmm. We try to fill up this void and nothing will fill it up except the Lord. So he saved me and changed me. I gave it, I gave it all up, got rid of the makeup, all the, the things that uh, pertain to, you know, the world and pride. I took the low place, Dennis, and there is where happiness is found, is in the low place. When Jesus came the first time, he by bypassed the whole religious world mm -hmm. and went to some shepherds on a hill. And so with me, I, I just want to be a shepherd abiding on a hill. Well, Judy, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm very happy that you're happy. Yes. And I mean, I, I know you're living in Oklahoma City now on your, in no, Oklahoma. No, Broken Bow. <laughs> and Broken Bow. We live bow. in the boonies. We still have a home here, but we live in, have a farm in Broken Bow. Well, I, I, Judy showed me some pictures and, it's, and it looks beautiful. And, I, and I'm, I'm very happy for you because uh, you have your health and your beauty. And, and I know you're, you're going in the direction you've chosen and, and it is very well for you. I can see that. Oh. I can see it in your eyes. but. Uh, I'm still one of your great fans, Thank and uh, I wish you the very best. And who knows, one day I might see you there, you know, plucking that guitar and, and singing one of your great tunes. Well, and if you do come down to Broken Bow, I'll have a hard-boiled egg <laughs> and some pepper sauce ready. <laughs> that was my Cajun sauce. I, you know, eggs are nowhere. You've got to give them some life, so I do it with Cajun sauce. Thanks a lot, Judy <laughs> Thank Lynn. you. God and bless I, you. Thank you. Thank Sa you so much. Same to you, and I hope I see you again. Okay. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this word. <laughs>